Okay, I, I think we can uh, get uh, started. Uh, so my name is uh, Linda Yu, and it is my great uh, pleasure to be introducing you our uh, podium speaker today, uh, Professor Dr. Philip Ma, mm -hmm. who is uh, currently the director of the Department of uh, Microstructure and Quantum Matter at the Max Planck Institute uh, for the Structure and Dynamics of the Matter in Hamburg. So uh, Philip is uh, really the world's uh, pioneer and uh, also the uh, current leader in using uh, mesoscopic uh, technologies to really precisely uh, define the shapes of the uh, devices and uh, which takes us uh, to a, a really new regime of the uh, emergent phenomenon in a lot of different uh, quantum materials as uh, he will be talking to about. So uh, he did a lot of important uh, discoveries with uh, really cool experiments allowed uh, this way. And uh, uh, this includes uh, the first uh, demonstration of um, transport on a uh, surface uh, from the arcs in three-dimensional top lot of the semi-metals and uh, demonstration of the hydrodynamic interactions among the electrons in, um, in, in metallic systems. And also the discovery of the many um, many new phases in strongly correlated electron systems that would be elusive otherwise. So, um, in terms of the academic uh, trajectory, uh, Philip got his PhD at uh, in twenty twelve at ETH uh, Zurich, and uh, after Zurich he moved to Berkeley and uh, uh, did a, did a postdoc there. And in 2016, he moved back to um, to Max Planck um, Chemical Max, Max Planck Institute of Chemical Solids and Dresden, and he started uh, his independent group. And in 2018, he uh, started assistant of professor position at uh, EPFL in Switzerland. And very recently, he uh, I, I believe in 2021 moved to his current position at uh, Max Planck Institute of the, um, Structure and Dynamics Matter in Canada. So uh, Philip is also the recipient of, of a lot of different prizes, including it was uh, Curtis Science Prize and the ABB uh, Prize from the Space Physical Society and uh, uh, the ERC starting branches to an end of field. So with this, I would uh, like to give the stage to Philip to tell you about uh, the exciting uh, things that's happening in his group. All right, well, thank you. Thank you, Linda, for the uh, 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 very kind introduction. Uh, yeah, yeah, this is this is quite a quite a ride, and uh, now I'm setting up this uh, this new building that you can see here, and trying to fill this with life within uh, the Max Planck Society. I really thought that I found my home at EPFL, and then that was an an opportunity I couldn't pass on. So it's also a lengthy transition process. But yeah, so, so thanks very much for being here. And, and if I think back, really, the time in Berkeley was was very very uh, uh, enriching and important for me and for my career. And I very, very fondly think of California. I made it down to LA, but I've never made it here to Pasadena before. So when then Linda contacted me and said, oh, do you want to give this here? And I said, yes, I definitely have to come to Caltech. I'm, I'm really excited and honored to be here today. So, so thanks so much, Linda, for, for, for considering me. Yeah, I, I wanted to take you into a, a, a ride for the next, uh, well, 50 to 55 minutes on quantum materials and the mesoscale. And what I find interesting, it's a, it's a bit of a mixture of stuff that um, is person my personal interest as well as what is going on in the field. So I, I, I'm trying to give us somewhat of a broad overview until we then can go into some more more detailed cases. And for those a little bit further away from the field of say quantum materials or quantum effects in materials, I would argue that the common goal that all of us for material synthesis, materials discovery, physics in materials, somehow binds together is the is the question of functionality within quantum matter. Functionality, I don't necessarily mean devices, but I really mean interesting quantum phenomena that appear in the solid, right? And accessing this complexity, in my particular case, I'm most interested in many body quantum states, that you can play with these, these states. And then if you, from 18 meters away, look at the problem, I would argue that there's a somewhat hierarchy in this field, where we started out from really discovery and stumbling into new things and trying to, oh, there's a material, let's understand this material. 
And on our path towards design on demand, where we could really say, oh, this is a sensing application, or I want to have the perfect qubit that's perfectly coupled, or whatever is your is your interest. And again, I'm not talking about applications, but really what is the what is the physical physical phenomena of quantum many body quantum systems? You can design. We, we're not there. I would argue we're somewhere here on this trajectory that we're going into a very exciting phase of demonstrator systems. Think, for example, on the Moray systems in graphene. That's something that we can very well understand and we can really start to design systems. Maybe their practicality isn't there, but functionality is definitely there. And, and, and we start to build up small molecules. We start to build up small systems that we can really understand in a rational design type of fashion. And so hopefully we can, we can move forward on this, on this scale. And now what interests me is some of the question, how did we get there? And of course, how do we, how do we move forward, right? And the way I think about this, again, trying to paint a broad brush picture of this, is I try to slice it in two dimensions. I try to slice it in the materials design and the microstructure design. So if you, if you somewhat think of starting out here, traditional materials research, the physics of copper and, 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 and silicon, and people wondered why this is, some things are conducting and some not, Broch theory, these types of things. The community essentially walked into two paths. One was the materials design path, it's particular in the materials chemistry, where we wanted to go to complex systems. So let's leave these elements behind, look at compounds, arrange the atomic orbitals to achieve, again, functionality, not applied, but functionality, new types of physics, cooperates, for example, coming about heavy fermion type systems that really come from the interplay of different orbitals and, well, designing physical chemistry and traditional single crystal type stuff. The other part of this community, I would say, stuck, stuck true somewhat to their original materials like silicon and, and copper, but arranging them on the mesoscale. And this, of course, has huge practicality. This is all of the devices and gadgets we use all day. But it also comes with new physics. It comes with confinement physics. It comes with interface physics. If you think, for example, about a PN junction, that is physics you would never find in the macroscopic homogeneous bulk. So there's new phenomena that came from the fact that you could rearrange systems and control shapes and sizes, again, of the well-known materials. And so if someone shows you a quadrant plot, right, of course, the most exciting is the last quadrant where they converge. So here, I even colored it orange to, 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 to highlight this one. So that's what we're trying to do. And this, I think, is not just my group, but it's, it's happening in many places in the US and in the world, trying to reconfine this, trying to reintroduce the physics of devices into the physics of strongly correlated electron systems, topological systems, chemically complex materials, to recombine this and then ask questions like, is there something like a, say, field effect transistor effect in a condo semi-metal? And how could we actually ask this question? How could we build something that could show this? So I'm very much interested in shape effects. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. How can we achieve similar? Well, I wouldn't even dare say this, but likely close to similar perfection in a binary or ternary compound, single crystal that we would get with silicon technology, right? We will likely not get to silicon, but what could we get? So for now, just imagine that you have a magical tool that generates single crystals in arbitrary shapes in three dimensions. So that's the key point. Three-dimensional structures as opposed to layer lithography and chemically complex stuff that you just can't process in other ways. Let's imagine what this is. And I wanted to show you a few concrete examples, not from me, but what has really happened in LTM. So for example, there's a very interesting case of iron intercalated niobium disulfide, which is an antiferromagnet. And there's a lot of business, as you know, nowadays in writing data in antiferromagnetic structures. You could use domain walls, for example. They're much faster to move, cost less energy to move than ferromagnetic domain walls. Um, how could you actually do something like this? So now you, you, you synthesize all of these materials, but you somehow need to bring it into a shape that's readable and writable. And so they use focused ion beam machining, my, my favorite tool, and cut out of a crystal this type of union jet type structure where you can pulse a very strong current density and then switch the antiferromagnetic domain pattern that you can read out, and then you can switch it between different states. And it can show that that's very fast and, and effective. This is done in, in, in James Analytics Group in, 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 in Owen Berkeley. Um, uranium ditelluride is, 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 is really capturing a lot of the condensed matter physics uh, community right now. 
which is a field reentrant superconductor. It's a really bizarre compound. It superconducts a two Kelvin. It's a heavy fermion. So you would say likely four, 500 Ørsted is fine to kill its superconductivity. It really is not. Here you see resistivity is a function of field. It survives up to 10 Tesla, which is already far above its Pauli limit. But then superconductivity comes back in the 50 Tesla range and really survives up to 70, 75 Tesla. So you have something that superconducts at 70 Tesla, but has a TC of two Kelvin. How does that work? It's a very difficult materials perspective to get to this type of physics, but to really nail down what is the superconducting order, how do vortices work, one had to go to, to Microsoft. So this has been done in, 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 in Tony Helms' group. This, this is some, some fantastic work where really shaping and sizing gets us to the intrinsic physics of these types of uh, heavy fermion superconductors. Something else where shape is very important. Now, this doesn't come out well. This comes much better out on my screen. Anyways, the purple thing here is a, a hydrodynamic conductor. It's a tungsten diphosphide crystal, and it has steps. So if you look very closely here, it's kind of stepped. It's a very three-dimensional object. It's like a staircase. It becomes smaller every 10 micron. And so you can directly look at the shape response of this conductor. So if you think of electrons flowing as water, which is very colloquially speaking, um, you could imagine that these steps have a very profound impact on the conductivity, much more so than just changing the cross-sectional area. And so that's what we were looking at uh, in this time. This actually was done by, by, by Martin at EPFL, so this is my, my group's type of work. So I just wanted to give you some ideas of what you could do if you can take a crystal out of the oven and have it into any arbitrary shape and then probe its magnetic properties or its transport properties. And so that is kind of an overview of why things are important and where, where this is going. So for example, the antiferromagnetic domains are very much pinned by, by strain and by defects in, in, in this structure. So it's very important that you don't have any stress fields that would hold them in place uh, and you can really freely move them. Uh, uranium titanium is horribly chemically sensitive. It's very, very difficult to work with. So you really need to have good control over your crystal. And in this particular case, it's really three-dimensional physics. So that's, that's important. So I'm, I, I'm happy to discuss these cases in more detail. I just want to give you a flavor about the types of questions that we're, we're looking at in this, in, this, uh, uh, in this field. So I also don't talk only about the stuff that I did in the, uh, or that, that, that the team has been doing. So how do I want to structure this joyride? I want to start out with the introducing uh, some of the events that have been happening in the technology-focused ion beams in the last couple of years. So there have been some very interesting technical changes that change our workflows. Um, and then discuss some of the recent science cases, for example, ballistic conduction, um, as well as interacting electrons in cadmium metals. This is really new stuff because I didn't want to show all the, all the old things. This is something happening right now. This is unpublished things, but if you want to read on the published stuff, you can see it here, as well as some spatial landscapes. And then if time permits, I want to show you the total crazy. What, what do we do on Friday afternoons? Okay, let me start with focus ion beam machining. So the challenge now is that you can't just go on universitywafers.com and buy your cuprate in a 15-inch wafer and then process it. It comes as Single crystals, it comes as maybe, maybe called a crystalline blobs with strange phases, maybe it's only powders. Some of you have very strange starting materials. So a lot of the traditional lithography methods are out of the window anyways because of the shape and the form of these materials. But you want to use this to start with to then get to structures that are in the, say, sub-micron to many tens of micron size to then study them. In, in hybrid chips. And that's what we're doing with, uh, uh, with our focus ion beams. Very generically, I made this once to, to get some money from the EU, uh, but ignoring the label of this purple blob, which just says topological semi-metals, just imagine that this purple blob here is a single crystal that you're interested in. It could be a wild semi-metal, it could be a cuprate, it could be a uranium compound. And then we, we start out with cutting a template out of this. So we focus our beam of ions, usually with xenon, uh, onto a nanometric spot that evaporates the material. And out of that, we cut a slab, usually this 100 micron wide, 10 micron long, and maybe a micron thick. It's then integrated onto a silicon chip. We make contents, and then we fabricate it into whatever shape you need. Now, this is maybe the most boring shape. That's because I'm not very good at Blender, but this could also be a a ring geometry, this can be three-dimensional geometries, it really depends. So our workflow is very different from that of layered lithography because we make the structures in pre-space and when they're done, 
we place them on the substrate. That actually is very important because it helps us minimize or tune the stress between the substrate and the sample at will. And that's very important if we want to utilize strain or if we want to eliminate strain for the, uh, uh, for the physics that's at, at hand, right? So right now I'm just talking about shaping. So in general, once you have these types of structures, you can ask questions on tran uh, uh, quantum transport, and in particular ballistic to quantum crossovers. I'm very much interested in hydrodynamic flow of electrons, where there's a lot of shape, shape function resonances. I'm interested in the field of topological systems, because they're obviously sort of about boundary correspondence. You have a lot of leeway of playing. What are the actual surfaces? of your material and how do they contribute to transport? For example, here there's a triangular conductor as well as heavy fermions where there's, there's a very important question of guiding the currents correctly and, and learning about, for example, anisotropies of, of condo scattering. So there is really more of a directionality of, of flow. Just to show you how these structures usually look like, scales are in the typical tens of micron, okay? So they're big. We, we tend to somewhat stay above 100 nanometers. So within this field of focus I and B, we have just last year sit together with a lot of experts in this field, and we tried to paint a roadmap of what is happening there, there currently. So it's a beam of ions, really that simple, and you focus it on your sample. So what you can do is you can work in subtractive mode. You etch away locally your material. You can also work in additive mode, where you put with the with a gas injection system, some gases that absorb, and then you can deposit things. So you can deposit superconducting materials, you can deposit insulators, you can deposit metals, and thereby build up heterostructures. And you can also do lithographic direct writing or implantation, which is very interesting types of fields that our friends in quantum uh, uh, computing exploit quite a bit. And with these types of fabrication uh, uh, technologies, you can work on a wide range of materials uh, for, for various applications, like cosmonics, quantum photonics, some mechanical type of structures. I'm very much interested in uh, functionalizing STM and AFM types of tips. So that's something that we're, we're doing. And also there's a lot going on in micro nanofluidics. So if you want to talk about these subfields, more than happy to do so. But if you're really thinking about shaping of quantum materials, then I, 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 I very much like this plot, which by and large plots resolution versus speed. So it's a, it's a single atom sputtering event. So this technique is slow. To make it faster, you just need more atoms. To have more atoms, you need to open up your aperture. You make your beam broad, you lose resolutions. Clearly, you, you, have to, you have to pick your battles. And the, over many, many decades, this field was dominated by the gallium field, where you work in the 100 nanoamps to maybe tens of picoamps or 10 picoamps, picoamp range. So that's where these sources are stable. And you have resolutions in the, in, the, in the tens of nanometers to maybe hundreds of nanometers range. And this is the fib that is most widely used. I saw a fantastic one here in the, in the Kavli Nano Center. So this is the, the, the backbone of this, the industry. It comes with a lot of things like gallium implantation. And so it, 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 it shapes somewhat the way how we think about focused ion beams. By now, we have about sources for any element. So if you want to have a cesium fib, you can go and buy a cesium fib. And there's people doing this for various reasons. Um, what has been very successful is development of plasma FIBs. So these are mostly xenon-based technologies, but we're operating multi-gas species systems. So we can use xenon, argon, oxygen, and nitrogen that helps with energy matching. These are technologies for very large structures. This is the millimeter to micron range. And then there's also the helium neon uh, uh, microscope, which you also have, have here available. And that allows you to have ultra high brightness beams in the sub nanometer range that's fantastic for porous materials, graphene structuring, um, milling of, 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 of things in the uh, almost atomic scale, few atom, uh, atomic scales, I guess. So there's, there's a huge breadth of different technologies that you have available to show you some things that you could do. For example, with the neon beams, you can very easily get plasmonic antenna type structures. With the plasma fib, you can get millimeter scale, uh, 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 millimeter scale objects. And again, all in somewhat interesting, interesting materials. And so now we're also complementing this with laser applications to really do centimeter to, 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 to nanometer type of fabrication. Um, typical, more complex types of structures, things that I, uh, uh, we're doing currently uh, involve somewhat elastic deformation. So kind of making things and then playing with the elastic degrees of freedom here, for example, there's a bending mode. You can think of twisting, twist modes for chiral deformations, chiral strain fields. 
You can think of machining freestanding free LC resonators if you want to couple to high frequency radiation or really complicated uh, structures. So this is a self-resonating heavy fermion superconducting switch. We can discuss about all of this. I just want to give you an idea of what you can do if you remove the, the thin film from the substrate and really have it in space and massage it in any way that you want. So, okay, this is all. This is all what happens right now. So that, that's some of the idea I wanted to give you. More than happy to discuss more things about the focused ion beam. We can discuss surfaces. We can discuss chemistry. We can discuss what materials it's used for and different strategies for classes of materials. I just didn't want to turn it into a complete materials machine talk. So feel free to ask me at any time if you have questions. Um, otherwise, I'll just jump into the physics. Is that okay? Okay, then let's do physics, because that's at the end of the day what, we, what we're doing things for. Um, so there's a large stream of research in the group going on on palladium cobaltate. So this is one of these De La Fossette materials, and you can think about this as essentially hexagonal planes of palladium that are separated by cobalt oxide. So it's a highly two-dimensional conductor, and it's a Fermi surface, or the elegance of the Fermi level entirely come from these palladium atoms. So that's where the conduction comes from. So by and large, you can think about this as hexagonal palladium sheets that weakly are weakly coupled. And, uh, uh, and not surprisingly, in such a 2D system, you find then a Fermi surface that is almost perfectly two-dimensional. Has a nice twist to it, namely that its cross-section area is almost a mathematically perfect hexagon. So it's very, very hexagonal, not round. There's no mystery also here. This is what happens just from free electron bands on a hexagonal lattice. It's the crossover from the whole cylinder to the thing. That's just fine-tuned to the point where it's well, almost exactly hexagonal. It's ultra clean. You can see all beautiful quantum oscillations in this. So we know the Fermi surface of this material very, very well. Um, it happens to be the most conductive oxide that we have. Oxides tend to be a little bit bad on the conduction side. Here, see, its in-plane resistivity starts out at a few microohm centimeters at room temperature. So it's almost as good. Now, copper is more conductive, but it also has three times more electrons. So its mean free path is already better than copper. And then at low temperatures, you end up something like five to six nanohm centimeters. So this is really a very, very, very clean metal. And because of that and its lower carrier density, uh, you end up with very long mean free paths, 20, 25 micro mean free paths. And it's, it's a very pure material. Everything you come take out of the oven, there's no magic, no 30 years of materials optimization. You just throw it into the oven, you pick out the crystal, it will have 20, at least 20 microns of mean free path. It's actually hard to disorder, but that's a separate story. So if you compare to other uh, uh, famous oxides that we know, rhenium oxide, iridium oxide, it is way more conductive than those. Now, you can discuss whether or not this is fair, because in this case, the oxygen doesn't contribute to the transport. Okay, that's that's then your choice, but it, it's an oxide. And yeah, and you end up with the few nanohom centimeters. This is how these crystals look like. So they're very, very beautiful faceted crystals, very thin platelets, half millimeter. You can see already the 60 degrees from the hexagonal unit cell in there. And now the question that we started out with is what if one sees something about this hexagonal shape in the conductivity? And usually you would do the argument, say, okay, you have a you have a hexagonal system, you have a threefold rotational axis. So you look up your group theory and you would say, aha, my conductivity in the plane must be isotropic. Why? Well, you do all of these, the matrix multiplications with the threefold rotation symmetry, and then you'd find that three, four, and six-fold rotational systems, they must be isotropic. Your conductivity tensor must be diagonal. Okay, so sigma xx and sigma yy. So it doesn't really matter where you put your where you put your leads. But it's of course not quite true because we don't live in that infinitely sized crystal. In reality, the shape of this object, the, the macroscopic shape, will not be rotationally symmetric. This crystal clearly you rotate it doesn't overlap. The point group does, but the crystal does not, which is an effect that usually you don't see because surface scattering terms are not really relevant as compared to bulk scattering terms. But if you make this object small enough, maybe you can start to see this. And that's actually somewhat of a non-trivial statement because you can have a crazy Fermi surface that obeys uh, uh, the right uh, uh, point group symmetry. And it will always give you, from a Boltzmann point of view, an isotropic in-plane transport. So you never see anything about the shape. But if you make it small enough, you actually do. And that has something to do with the way that the Fermi surface 
the Fermi momenta and the Fermi velocities are distributed. So here I compare the real Fermi surface of palladium cobaltate to a circle, right? You would say it's pretty circular, so there's not a big of a difference. But of course, the main difference is that the hexagon has all of these facets. The group velocities are, of course, normal to these facets. So here there will be essentially electrons moving this direction, moving that direction, moving this direction, whereas on the circle, they go in any direction. So if you plot a histogram of all of the available velocities, like the group velocity directions, you will find that these things are very different. The circle has very has completely uniform distribution of velocities, but the hexagon has these spikes for these three directions with time reversal symmetry, six, that the electrons can move. So you could really think of it as, as kind of a taxi type geometry in a weird triangular uh, uh, um, system. It still has three-fold rotation symmetry. Also this velocity distribution, of course, it must have. Therefore, its resistivity tensor is diagonal. But you would see this now if you think of going to a ballistic limit where only surface scattering is important. If you have a circular Fermi surface, you kind of shoot, now this is cannonball physics, semi-classical electrons into this thing and they will go everywhere. And of course, it doesn't matter how you rotate the bar with respect to the crystal because, well, it's a circular Fermi surface. In the hexagon, it's very different. If you go in one direction where it's, let's say, rotated like this, you have this beam of, of, of massive diversion density states that essentially moves along this thing and never sees your boundaries. So there will be no boundary scattering. If you off rotate it like this, there's no such state, and the electron just bounces between the different sides of this uh, 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 of this structure. Okay, so you would actually expect an anisotropy in the ballistic conduction that is forbidden by group symmetry in a diffuse case. So how does this work? You take a single crystal. You now could pattern in there some current voltage bar. Then you pattern another current voltage bar that's at an angle, and then you ask the question, are they the same or not? If they're the same, well, then it's more group theory diffuse. If they're not the same, there's some interesting physics coming from the case that you make it ballistic. And of course, I wouldn't take you through all of this is that now is not the case. I just want to show you first what is the real structure. It's a bit more complicated. Essentially, we, we, we cut this whole crystal into a, uh, well, what do you call this, a meander, I guess. So we can inject current here, current flows along this thing. And then all of these colorful bars have 10 degrees increments. So there's one at zero, 10, 20, 30, which are aligned with XID with respect to the, to the crystal structure. So you can look at the direction dependence of current flow in this hexagonal system. And indeed what we see is this. So this resistivity in nanocentimeters function of temperature, it's diffusive in the high temperature range. So here, all of them are the same. This is great. Group theory works. Here you have so many phonons in that you have so short mean free path that really you talk about a resistive tensor that comes from defect scattering, phonon scattering. Right? But as you cool down, you freeze out these phonons and you enter at around 30 Kelvin, you enter into the ballistic regime. And there's a big difference now on the, of the resistivity that you get as a function of, of angle. And indeed, the one that is zero degrees, so the one with straight cannonballs, has about uh, uh, two times, two and a half times less resistance than the one that is at, at 30 degrees. So you can directly see now signatures of the difference from a rotationally symmetric Fermi surface to this in ballistic transfer. It's actually a very nice uh, finite size effect. You can completely understand this from a, a, a quantum Monte Carlo simulation. So you, you shoot these electrons in and you look at all of these trajectories and you find exactly this type of result. So even the statistics we get, the statistics you get right from the rounding of this corner is of course not a mathematical hexagon, it's slightly rounded. We can discuss these details, the then give you small deviations here. But in reality, what you get is two directions. One direction that shoots electrons straight along the bar and one where there's really no propagation along the bar. So that's what you then can see as a result of the small shape and size of this object. So that's what I find interesting about this. So this has been this has been starting. So I want to tell you a bit about what we're, how we're following up on this nowadays. Now I want to ask the following question. Say you have a system like this, layered system, whatever is your favorite, TMD, De La Fossite, Graphite, doesn't really matter. All of these quasi-2D systems are characterized by very strong bonds in the plane and then weak bonds out of plane. May even be Van der Waals bonds, right? Then it's very easy what we can do. We cleave them. We use scotch tape and we peel them off. We know the prices. So that's, that's great. This is fantastic physics because here the, 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 the nature of the bond anisotropy 
helps us to fabricate atomic structures. It's such a, a beautiful thing that happens, right? But if you think about this a little bit more, there must be more to this because graphite, I, I, I have graphite in my hand, it's a three-dimensional object. Now there's a two-dimensional limit in graphite. And that means there also must be a one-dimensional limit in there because otherwise you somehow lost the dimension. That doesn't work. So graphene is the 2D limit, but what is missing there is this blue rod. And formally speaking, that's an atomic chain. It's a molecule of carbon that has some very unhappy carbon-carbon bonds. This, of course, will explode immediately. So this is pointless. But what if you make it a little bit bigger so that you can kinetically stabilize the object? Think of it as graphite nanoflakes or graphite microflakes that you stack. This is horrible. You never want to do this, like stacking 10,000 graphene sheets. But you can cut this out of graphite and think about what actually happens in this one dimension limit. This has been very fruitful direction of uh, 1D physics in graphene. It's kind of anti-graphene if you want. Um, and I'll, I'll tell you what this, what this stuff does. From a machining point of view, it's clear that this is a disaster. The graphene wants to exfoliate. Graphene, graphite wants to become graphene. It's very easy. The other direction is very hard. You really have to make sure that there's no force in your fabrication concept. Otherwise, it just flakes apart and it does its normal graphene thing. This is where the ion beam is key because it's a kinetic technique, but it has no force. It evaporates. It evaporates very gently. It doesn't put any force on the sample. So you can actually make these types of, of, of pillars, okay? So what happens? What happens is very interesting. So imagine now you have these types of coupled islands where you have an out-of-plane hopping term in the melee electron bolts and in-plane hopping in the electron bolts. So huge in-plane bands, but tiny, tiny warping in the cylinder in the out-of-plane direction. Now, the whole idea of a Fermi surface breaks down, even though you're in a limit of many, many, many Fermi momenta in the plane. But because the problem is anisotropic, you really have to think about this as a delocalized quantum island. And the, out, the, the transport along this, this thing really is a transport of this delocalized state hopping into the next plane. It's kind of going into the next story of a, of a building. Okay? And you can see that this must be the case because the semi-classical transport in the, in the C direction right, is given by the warping of the cylinder. There are some states that have the highest uh, inclination. And those are the most important states for infinite crystal out of plane transport. But what if the thing is so small that a semi classical wave pack doesn't even make it into the next layer? It makes no more sense to think about this in terms of Boltzmann transport on a Fermi surface, just scaling it down. There's a, there's a new type of regime, which we're, we're looking at quite intensely, that happens when you go to this, to this quantum island type of limit. For example, you can apply an in plane magnetic field. So you put some field in between these planes. And then you see an Aaron of bohm like effect of uh, interference when these wave packets move into the next layer. It will count how many single particle flux quanta are stuck in between these atomic planes. And if you do this, you see fantastic magneto resistance oscillations. So this is second derivative of the magneto resistance along this thing is a bunch of field. You see these field linear oscillations. They're exactly single particle flux quanta stuck in a box. And this box is now one atom high but 10,000 atoms wide, because we have micron-sized structures. But this is the box that is important for this, um, for this process. This has been a lot of fun. We're doing this still quite a bit. Another surprising property of these is that they're actually fantastic transparent conductors. Now, likely not applicable ones, but that's a different story. Um, you can take a lot of these layered materials and you can make them completely transparent by making them thin in the AC plane. These are layered materials. They like to go in the AV plane. Everybody knows how graphite looks like. It's, it's that black and shiny. Um, and, and, and they like to grow in these big plates. But if you somehow take a slice, like you, you, you cut a slice through this, so you make an AC plane, you have a very interesting structure because now this is highly conductive in the sheets, but is highly insulated, or at least very poorly conductive in the perpendicular direction. So if you now linearly polarize an electric field such that of light, such that it's, it's, it points perpendicular to these planes, you can look through this. And so you can have all of these, uh, for example, stonciruthenate or cuprates, and you can look at them while they go superconducting with cuprates. Not the stonciruthenate may be harder, but with cuprates, you, you put, put them in nitrogen, and you watch them go superconducting. They're brownish in this limit. It's, it's very interesting. Um, they are record transparent conductors. They, beat, they blow ITO out of the water. 
Um, they're likely not useful because this configuration is easy to chop with the right techniques, but making a thin film for a screen, maybe not. But okay, I, I wrote this differently when I wrote this paper. Um, good. Okay, so that, that is some of the case of anisotropic systems where with the focused ion beam, you can achieve directions that you otherwise don't get because the stuff likes to grow planar. And we don't want planar, we want the kind of the other direction, right? Okay, if it's okay for you, and, and now I'm just trying to give you a broad brush, right? And I really hope we get some more discussions later. Uh, I wanted to go a bit to the Kagome method. So there's a lot of stuff we did in, in, in Kagome's in the last couple of years. I want to show you now something that you haven't yet seen because it's not yet published, but it's, it's, coming, it's coming close to this stage. So what is, what's the physics? Um, we're working on this particular compound cesium vanadium antimony, which is a Kagome layer of vanadium atoms. Then there's the interstitial of, of uh, um, antimony, and they're separated now by potassium. You can also put you can put cesium in here. Potassium, we mostly work with cesium because it's the cleanest. Um, and now what this system does, it is a Kagome up to about 90 Kelvin. There is a charge density wave transition. We all agree on this transition. They slightly distort. There's superconductivity at low temperatures. There's a lot of things about interacting phases. I, I don't have the time to, to, to go into, we can discuss. But what is very clear here from uniaxial strain measurements or pressure measurements, that there's a strong antagonistic role between the charge density wave and the superconductivity. So if you somehow suppress charge density wave temperature, your TC goes up and vice versa. So clearly these two compete for density of states, at least that's the, that's, that's the general law. And so now you could imagine what if you stabilize a system where you could somehow on a chip level change the, the, the charge density wave transition. Can you then somehow switch superconducting to see this actually very hard. If you have a superconductor like aluminum, you will not change its TC. It's just, it's, it's it, right? But here you have a degree of freedom and I want to tell you why. So these are crystals of it. Again, same story, layered compound, thin, long crystals. They're about half a millimeter. Uh, 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 wide, but only 40 micron thick, and they're very, very soft, very hard to work with. So what we had to do is we had to take our cross sections, which is here in purple, and then completely decouple them from the substrate by making very springy gold coated contacts to have them very soft, they're very, really the, the, the most softest touch you could do to something that still has wires to it so that we get to this physics. And there's a lot of things that happened there, many interesting papers. I don't want to touch on them. I want to focus on one physical property of this. Namely, think about how such a system goes to the charge density wave transition. So you put here temperature, at high temperature, this is a Kagome plane, well stacked, and now you cool it into the charge density wave state. Now it takes some order, there's actually debates whether or not this is two by two by two, so AB stacking or two by two by four, it doesn't really matter, it finds its, it's fine this thing, and then you, 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 you take the physical properties. What? if you just blast that thing through the density wave transition. So you quench cool this, and let's say a million Kelvin a second, you don't give the system kinetically the time to find its happy two by two, uh, two reconstruction, okay? Because all of these sliding motions, it essentially is a translation of the entire plane. So what if the system just doesn't have enough time and enough kinetic energy to actually reach this, and you kinetically block a state that is metastable? which is what we call Kagome glass. I think this sounds nice and well selling, but really what it means is it's a random stack. There's no order in the out of plane direction. And this is what we can get to quite naturally from these structures because we can just blast it with current. We blast huge DC currents to that thing, dual heat it while the system stays at base temperature or that the chip stays at base temperature. Of course, you, you want to sh hire a short current pulse, right? You don't want to heat up the entire cryostat with this. And then this is what you see. So here, this is the DC resistance of this device as a function of current bias. So cross sections is in the square micron. So we're talking about tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of amps per square centimeter. This is a lot of, lot of current, okay? Um, as you increase current, joule heating, T squared or I squared will give you temperature. So, so the thing starts to slowly warm up. And then as you get through more current, 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 it, it heats faster and faster. And so what is important now is that here, there is a bloop where it goes back down. So putting more current in gives you a little bit less resistance. Then if you look at the phase that, or the, the, the resistance without all of this bias of temperature, you see that the charge density wave transition comes in as this little nose here. 
right? And so that's what happens here. So the, this is the current driven demise of the charge density wave transition. And then you can heat more and more and more and more, and you end up something like 200 Kelvin. While the system still says that it's two Kelvin bath, right? And now you switch it off. The system crashes down. Thermal time constants are tiny because it's cubic micron, right? So this tiny, tiny time constant. So you can really achieve massive cooling rates. And indeed, what you can see is that the resistance as a function of temperature, as a function of quench rate, goes up the out of plane resistance. This is the disorder you put in. Okay, I've shown you here up to this, we're now pushing this forward and forward. I actually don't know whether the numbers is in the crisis right now, but it's kind of, it's, it's pushing it upwards. And so this actually, this actually works, right? So we're now tailoring the pulses. We need to, we need to go to even shorter time scales to quench it more brutally, right? Um, but it works. And so then as you warm it up, you see uh, above the charge density wave transition, there's no more memory. That makes sense. You melted it thermally again. So there, there can't be any residual thing. What is not quite remarkable is that the response in the superconducting state. So very clearly with increasing quench rate, the onset of superconductivity goes up. And this is reversible. So you can now do a slow current pulse and then TC just goes back to where it was before. You quench it again, you go up and down, up and down. We don't switch these transitions are still broad. We don't switch it perfectly. So this is kind of the onset of thing. But I just wanted to show you the ideas of how you could manipulate with shapes and sizes systems beyond of what you would get in the thermodynamic equilibrium of big bulky crystals. Here is about joule heating. You, millimeter sized crystal, you need to stick copper rods to it to get that current density. So very hard. But it's of course something that on the chip level, if we ever think about integrating these somehow in technology, I don't even know what the technology could be. But if we do that, this is the types of physics we will find, right? And so that's the that's the um that's the direction. So it's just a, trying to give you a little bit of flavor, which hopefully sparks some some discussions. In the last part, I wanted to talk about heavy fermions, cor strong correlations, and uh, 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 yeah, super heavy fermion superconductors, essentially. Here, the question is whether or not you can take a single crystal of, a, of say, a heavy fermion, but now you imprint a tailored strain field in it. You don't do uniaxial pressure. This is done a lot. But you really do a very, very complicated strain field. That strain is a position within the device. And if TC is a function of the strain, you might get very interesting landscapes of TC. Now you could say, well, if you just plastically deform it, you get crazy landscapes of TC. Yes, that's true. But if you deform it in the right way, you actually might get interesting landscapes in, in TC. So how do we do this? Well, we simply exploit some differential contraction between our slab that we fib cut and the substrate. In this case, it's sapphire. So it is the nice property that it basically has almost no thermal contraction. So sapphire just very little contracts Whereas most, especially cerium, four or five compounds, they contract like crazy. So this, this material wants to contract a lot. So it can't because it's rigidly welded. So it will be under a lot of tensile strain. So this is how we get tensile strain in, but it will be welded at the surface boundaries. So the boundary condition to the mechanical problem is what you can address with shaping. And that's what we're doing. TC in all of these systems very much dependent on pressure in particular also on uniaxial strain. So what you see here is TC as a function of directional pressure. So if you put pressure in the A direction, TC goes up. You put pressure in the C direction, TC goes down. So and this is really cool because it has different signs of equal magnitude. So you can even compensate, right? So you could put a little bit of pressure on the A and the same pressure on C and you get the same TC back what you started out with. So you can see how this, this can be a very interesting engineering game to get non-trivial superconducting uh, uh, responses. So for that, it's, it's, it's really is fantastic. Surprisingly rich physics you get from the boring most device, which is a simple slab. So this slab is a micron thick, serum iridium in a pipe. Really key is that one direction is C direction and one direction is A direction. Everybody looks at the tetragonal system, everybody looks in the AB plane. But now again, this is an AC of this intermetallic. And so when that happens is, imagine you pull on it in all directions. What will happen is that in its center, it will actually be non-distorted. It will be distorted in both ways the same. But as you go further to the edges, so for example here, it will be more pulled in this direction, whereas on the other edge, it will be more pulled in the other direction. 
Now, one makes TC go up, and the other one makes TC go down. So you would expect actually a very interesting landscape of TC in this object, and that's what you see. So these are now actual scanning squid measurements of these slabs done uh, by my friend Katja Novak in, uh, uh, in Cornell. So if you go at low enough temperatures, everything shines up. That means there's complete Meissner shielding. That means I think it's just completely superconductive. That's good, that's TC half, that's what it's supposed to do. But then if you go above bulk TC, so let's say at 450 millikelvin, you see superconductivity is not yet gone. It, re it remains, right? You go to 475, it still is not yet gone. Now, all of this is well known in macroscopic crystals under uniaxial pressure. But now we have an interesting texture. So what happens here is that you essentially have two stabilized superconducting banks that are connected with this very weak superconducting wire, if you want, that you then separate at a little bit higher temperature. So you can play with, with, with the, um, with, for example, Josephson type couplings within an SNS type setting within the same single crystal without a junction. So this is one of the main goals. We're still working on this to build, uh, 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 well, junctionless uh, Josephson junctions. So what you could do for, for to achieve this is now to add more slits into this. Nothing crazy happens. All that the slits do is they change your mechanical boundary conditions. As you change your mechanical boundary conditions, you change the strain field. As you change the strain field, you change the TC landscape. And so what we've developed is essentially a console-based simulation, very simple, of how TC should look like given a certain pattern of slits. And what we now are working on is the inverse that we could say, I want this pattern of TC. Please tell me how to slice this up. But the inverse problem is a little bit more complicated. Forward is straight up trivial. You make a bunch of slits, and then you can compare the simulations to the measurements. And this, this actually matches really uh, really well. For example, you get, get these isolated islands of, of superconductivity in this structure. And now our based approach to the junction is Josephson junction is about this. So what you see here is essentially two banks of stabilized superconductivity that are connected with a very suppressed order parameter. That suppressed order parameter is because of a connection here that pulls on this and essentially generates a strip of superconducting suppression. And that at some intermediate temperature actually starts to, to isolate these and you, you, you move the thing metallic. Uh, what we're still working on in this direction is uh, to operate these at lower temperatures. And that's more difficult because you know, strain tends to be um, uh, uh, saturated at this at this temperature range, and so so really you only see the the, the TC landscape at a too high temperature scale. So that thermal fluctuation is too important. But anyways, this is an interesting way of how you can shape the superconducting order parameter in a complex material just by cutting it, slicing it up. Okay, and uh, yeah, so that's fantastic. This is the kind of last science case. I know I kind of ran you over with a lot of things, so I wanted to maybe end up with a little bit of a lighter question, which completely exposes both my ignorance and craziness, and just tell you something what we're doing on the, the Friday afternoon. And the Friday afternoon, well, likely there's, there's beers in that Friday afternoon. Uh, there's, a, there's a simple question. So if we take a single crystal, we usually expand it. If we just take an infinite single crystal, we think of it as wrapping it on a torus, right? On a three torus, we take our brain zone and we plug it back into itself. And so it becomes a completely symmetric object. Now, this is, of course, only one way how you can connect it up. There's other ways of connecting it back up allowed by group symmetry. So, for example, you could take the, 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 the torus, perform a half rotation, if, if it has, for example, a C2 symmetry, and plug it back into itself. You can always put in a winding number this way by rotating it once before you plug it into itself. And then, then essentially you get a, a, a Möbius strip type reconnection. There's the whole bunch of math that's actually quite interesting that goes around how you can reconnect these types of finite geometries. Okay, the Möbius graphene, for example, was, 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 was fashionable in the old days, but that's actually not what I was thinking about. The, the question really is a, a question of reconnecting states in, in some of a non-trivial way. Is that, is that crazy? Can this work? The honest answer is I don't know. I don't know. It could be crazy. It could never work. Um, but we can try. So what we, what we can do, for example, is do this experiment. So we take a sapphire chip, and now we stick our, our springboard, essentially, cantilever here, which is here, meridium 5, just into space. So this is the real picture. So you see on top, there's a lot of 
a lot of silver for grounding, and then there's this thing sticking out. And this is our this is our cm iridium five. It's a D wave superconductor. At least we think it is. Um, well, it's interesting to to kind of put it into free space, and then we can pattern it because now it's stuck in free space. So here we've patterned it into this particular device. This is the first one we did, but now we have slightly better designs than this. Um, so we, we pattern it in this uh, this shape, which is essentially kind of a a big bulky piece up here, and then this. This, this very thin wire here, and now you can manipulate it. So you can come in here with a, with a micro manipulator. This is a, a sharpened tungsten needle, and you mate it with this thing, and now you can flex it, you can move it, right? And on that scale, if you go to square micro and below, things become very flexible. Why is that? That is because the strain gradient from bending doesn't exceed the yield strain at the surface. It's very easy to bend a carbon nanowire, you break graphite. Right? So that's the same thing that you can do with any crystal. And so now you, you touch and you poke it and you kind of shove it under the thing and you pull it up and then you pull it back and now you hook it. Okay. So this, this is a very, very interesting structure. So the ones that you can tell me about this, this shows quantum oscillations. And for anybody who has measured ever quantum oscillations, heavy fermions is that they're damn hard to observe. But this works. So this piece here is still a fantastic elastically deformed single crystal. We've unhooked and hooked this over and over again. It really doesn't change. So all of this is still completely elastic. Where the plastic limit is at some point it will come, I don't know, but this is this at least is elastic. So now you've made a very interesting object because this is a crystal, it's, it's one single crystal object, but now here it has a slow gradient until then it forms a touching point. And of course this touching point is what we're after. What we wanna do is we wanna frustrate the Cooper pair tunneling through the junction that's made by this tip, if we can bend it more than 90 degrees and we can stick a plus to minus low, essentially we'd have a transition of this ring from a zero ring flux ring to a pi flux, pi flux ring. And you can very trivially show that this is mathematically equivalent to doing the tricrystal experiment in Cooper rates if that is a, it means something to you, instead of a flat space on a curved space. So you, you have to do tricrystals three if, you, if your space is flat, because otherwise there's no other way you frustrate the, 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 the tunneling part. If you could do the tricrystal experiment on a cone, you only need one junction. So anyways, that's the, that's the idea. And if this becomes coherent, now we kind of start to come to this direction of taking a long range coherent quantum system and plucking it back but with a geometric twist from twisting the the, 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 the thing. So, okay, this is this is really nowhere. This is in the fabrication stage. I'm, I'm, I'm interested, I, I like this. Uh, if you're interested and wanna run with it and do it yourself, I'm more than happy. Um, but uh, it's something that, that keeps us up again on the Friday evenings when work is done, you have to do something. And so what, where does this stop? At what level can you not take these gradients and consider them, for example, as artificial gauge fields that you renormalize your transport as through these slow variance bendings, and, and and what has happened, and how far can you go? So by far, by now we 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 actually come to 180 degrees. So this thing can be looped back into itself and be hooked in like this. It's not trivial because the connection is rigid, so you kind of have to have multiple intermediate hooks. It kind of like a clock. You go one forward, unhook, redo, clock forward, clock forward. Anyways, but this, these are fantastically flexible. So somewhat putting flexible, strongly correlated quantum materials on the, on the roadmap is, is something that will be very interesting, interesting to do. So yeah, this will be this is the future. Again, this is the crazy part. Uh, nothing published there, actually not in the next two years. It doesn't matter. Um, if you're interested in this, uh, I have a web page up here so you can oh sorry, this is not right. But web page is up here. you can you can take a look. The gallery is, is fantastic. Uh, if you're interested in research in Europe, then there's also a lot of opportunities there. Take a look. And again, I love being here, love being in California. I'm so grateful, Linda, that I could be here to give the uh, uh, give the colloquium. It was a lot of pleasure. Thank you so much. Thank you for listening. And uh, yeah, if you have any questions, we can discuss. Thank you. Any questions from the audience that are very strongly in front of the students? <laughs> What's the energy of the ion being and how do you prevent damage? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, um, energy ranges, I mean, these are standard ion sources. So, they run in the 30 kilo electron volt down to the 500 volt limit. 
And it depends on what material you want to work with and whether or not you want to have this, this damage and have it go away. So typically the amorphization layers at, at high voltages are in the 20, 25 nanometers. If you go to lower voltages, you can get them into the single digit nanometers. For some projects, this is important. So it's very hard, for example, to work on semiconductors. For some other projects, it's really not important, like for uh, ultra high conductivity metals. Having this amorphous surface coating is really not a, not going to change the, the thing in a parallel conductance type picture. Um, sometimes it's really essential, for example, in all of this flexible uh, stuff, it is very important to have this amorphous coating to actually enhance the, the yield strain of the material. That's, that's, it's, a, it's an integral part of the structure. Um, but yeah, it's, it's definitely there. It's on the order of 10 to 20 nanometers in many structures. And sometimes it needs to be polished down. You can also address it from a chemical point of view. That's right. That's right. The key here is, I mean, there's also in the, in the damage business, I think there's a lot of things that happen from the gallium beams. And so these are all gallium free type structures. So these are, they, they, they will still have kinetic damage, right? But they will at least not have implantations and bend bendings from the presence of gallium. For the chromium metal, when you um, heat it up with drill heating and when she cooled down, is it reversible or yeah. is there? Yeah. So so essentially you can you can tune your current protocol. So you, you do it slow, it goes back, you do it fast, it goes goes this way. We don't yet have cycle experiments like doing this 10,000. It is really a student in front of the, the, the thing doing by hand, let's do one second, right? So so we need to automate this and let's say do, do this 10,000 times. So first. I think we, we really want to optimize this so that we can shift the full TC transition instead of just looking at this, this onset, right? There's clearly we're amorphizing just parts of the sample. We want to amorphize all of the sample. And then we do this test. Yeah. Maybe I can ask a question. So, uh, how different are different materials uh, when they do this process? Very, very different. Very different. Uh, very, very different. So, and 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 of course, number one is is what is the surface uh, uh, surface state? Um, a because you could do some surface damage and you could fool yourself into measuring something that's not real. The other part is you want to make electric contacts to it and having contacts to something that is some type of damage layer that can be very difficult. So there's some materials, mostly intermetallics, they're very easy because they tend to be highly metallic also if they're amorphous and, and they, they never really are amorphous and so they polycrystallize. And so, so for them, it's very easy. Um, tellurides and selenides are really hard to work with. The uranium that telluride almost took a year to get the right recipes going. Um, the, the cesium vanadium antimony is easy to make but to get it strain free was a big hassle. So, so getting all of this membrane mounted um, uh, technology up. So it's very difficult to say. Uh, after a year, we tend to give up. So uh, there's some things we had to give up. Some are hard cuprates, for example, very hard. Because if you cut cuprates, you get a thermal gradient. And the thermal gradient leads to gradient diffusion of oxygen. So you end up with an oxygen depleted surface after the cutting. So this is this was this was very hard. Uh, we've fixed this problem now with the cryogenic stage. So you have to cool the system down to seventy Kelvin, so that even under fabrication conditions, you keep it uh, uh, below the mobility edge of oxygen, and then you freeze it back in. It's one way. Uh, other thing is we could re-anneal things. So this this really depends from material to material. It's, there's no one stop shop, sadly. But then, which technique is a one stop shop? Yeah, yeah, and you have yeah. to you have to analyze it a lot to see that it's is right what you're doing. Absolutely, yeah. Okay, uh, I think we're also at five. Uh, so if not, I want to thank you again. Yeah, thanks.